I'm Lois Jensen. I was a lead plaintiff for the first class action for sexual harassment. The story of sexual harassment in America cannot be told without my guest, the lead plaintiff in the field's first class action lawsuit, Lois E. Jensen versus the Eveleth Taconite Mining Company. Taconite is low-grade iron ore. They blast the hills and crush the rock. It turns into a steel product. Lois Jensen was a 27-year-old single mom when the Eveleth Company of northern Minnesota hired her as one of its first four women miners. From week one, some of the men at the mine made it clear that the women were not welcome. I was in a small cement room that had a conveyor belt galley in it. And a fellow came down that galley and came towards me. And he yelled, you effing women don't belong here. Go home where you belong. The verbal harassment progressed to physical groping. I was physically grabbed in the crotch. There were actually six men watching this guy do this. And they were laughing about it. Things would get even worse. I'm yelling for help, and no one is coming. I just, I wanted to say, why didn't you hear me? After many years of trying to get the company to hear her and being ignored, Lois Jensen finally took legal action, a 14-year-long road that left her physically ill and suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. There were good guys at the mine, Lois recalls for us, many of them. On two occasions, two separate men during this case, in that time frame of the first trial, came up to me and said, you're going to have as many men mad at you if you quit or as if you go ahead. So that tells you the dilemma the men were facing. Lois did not quit. The Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals would ultimately issue a powerful ruling which included these words. The emotional harm brought about by the record of human indecency sought to destroy the human psyche as well as the human spirit of each plaintiff. I'm Michael Shoulder. This is a Wavemaker Conversation series featuring pioneers in the battle against sexual harassment. My guest, speaking to me from her home in northern Minnesota, is Lois Jensen. Lois, thank you for joining me on Wavemaker Conversations, a podcast for the insanely curious. Thank you, Michael. Let's begin this in 1975. Spring of 1975, actually working for a credit union who paid minimum wage. I had a small family to support, and I had no benefits. The pay was so low that literally I had to get food stamps and I believe medical assistance as well through the welfare system in Minnesota. And one day a gal walked in who worked at a local mine and she cashed her check. And I kind of went, wow. And she told me what she did out there and I thought, okay. And at first I thought, you know, that's something that I probably wouldn't want to do, but I wouldn't mind the money. Shortly after that, a woman walked in who actually worked for Eveleth Mines in the personnel department and told me about Eveleth Mines being forced to hire four women through an EEOC order. She told me to apply and actually handed me an application. So I did. Do you remember how much you were making at the time at the credit union? Oh, gosh, I'm going to say like $1.30. I'm not quite sure at this point. You know, it's been a few years. And when your eyes opened up and saw that woman's paycheck, what did that read per hour? I went from a dollar thirty to uh, over five dollars an hour. Wow. Oh, I'm going to add my babysitter that I paid was a dollar an hour. You know, so that gave me thirty cents. <laughs> so yeah, it was a breath of fresh air. So it's sort of really incredible, a single mom paying more than half of your salary for child care, and suddenly you apply for this job, and did you have any trepidations about it? Do you remember the interview? The first interview I had, it was really kind of odd because the fellow doing the interview, he said, are you sure you really want this job because you're so small? And I said, well, I want to try. 
I knew it would be dirty work and it would be physical work versus desk jobs that I'd always had. But, you know, it's worth a try. My jobs to start with were um, shoveling rock, shoveling wet dirt and hosing to uh, wash down the gravel and keep the floors clean, keep the dust down. And that was sort of the beginning stages. The next stages were you were trained on small equipment like bobcats. Then you're trained on trucks, and the trucks varied from 50 tons to, I think the largest one I I drove eventually was 400 tons. How tall are you? I'm 5'2". So 5'2 and a 200-ton truck. Yeah, 400-ton truck. And I'm going to add, when I started, I was probably weighed about 115 pounds. The product I was carrying in the trucks was the waste product of the crushed rock. And so in the wintertime, it got to be pretty tricky because your truck would be seeping the water through. So it would freeze on the ground as you drove. I remember once trying to get up a hill and the truck slid backwards. They send equipment out to help you and... This fellow came out, and he was going to, oh, I'll do this because you don't know what you're doing. And he gets out of his truck, and he fell on the ice because it was that slippery. And it turned out it took him quite a long time to get the truck up and going, too, and he needed help as well. So it wasn't just the five foot two blonde who couldn't drive. So this is clearly not work that anybody is really groomed for or trained for. And as they would say up there, that the tradition was this is men's work. What happened that sort of made it clear this working environment is going to be tougher than just the job itself? The first day was a tour of the plant and the concentrator area. And the foreman indicated that he wasn't going to have any women on his crew. During the tour, a lot of the men just looked at you like they'd never seen a woman before, for one thing. Within the first week, I was working in what's called the Mexican feeder area. I was in a small cement room where that had a conveyor belt galley in it. And a fellow came down that galley, and you could tell by his demeanor he was angry. And he came towards me, and he yelled, you effing women don't belong here, go home where you belong. From there on, graffiti showed up. A hangman's noose ended up in my work area. There were other verbal confrontations. I remember being in a galley once. You know, it's a tight area. And being pretty much threatened with a guy that came by and said, you know, I want what I want when I want it. And I got by him. Uh, So the isolation part was huge. You know, these are things that happen. You don't know where they're going to go, if there's more to it than words. And, of course, there's no one witnessing it. Pretty intimidating stuff, and it got kind of scary at times. Then there were other times when, well, this is very unpleasant, but uh, the graffiti would change and have your name on it with you doing things with other people, other men. I was physically grabbed and the crotch. It was meant as a joke. There were actually six men watching this guy do this. And they were laughing about it. And there were other people walking in the area. It was common knowledge by the time I ended up at the end of the shift because he also had grease on his hand. So the telling sign was there. I was wearing it. I put a jacket around my waist, but as I walked out, there were comments being made. So they knew this stuff was going on. I will tell you, at that point, I almost quit. That was my first year there. I almost quit. Why didn't you? Well, I actually went and talked to my folks about it. And my father said, well, you know, if you could stick it out a little bit longer, you could at least put some money aside. And that'll give you a better start somewhere else. Hmm. You know, that made sense. So these examples you gave me just from the first year, did they get worse? And how long did they persist? Oh, let me go back to the very beginning. To be hired, you had to go through a physical. The physical was supposed to make sure you don't have any back injuries when you go in so that you can do the work. I think that's probably illegal now, too, but I really don't know. So anyway, with our physicals, the women were handed a sheet of paper 
that they wanted us to be tested gynecologically. They wanted, you know, our ovulation dates or whatever, <laughs> you know, it was so personal that it was embarrassing to read it, let alone go in. And I contemplated seriously not going to the physical. I just thought, man, this is just awful. Thankfully, when I went into the clinic for the physical, the doctor looked at it and he said, we're not doing any of this. In fact, I think he even indicated he's never seen anything like that. So, you know, it sets you up to, one, not know what to expect. So you have to be totally open-minded. And I had no previous experience of sexual harassment. So for me, it was really kind of a, a shocker that this stuff was going on. One of the rules when I was hired was there was no magazines, no newspapers, no graffiti. The guys couldn't have any of this stuff. So when I started, the walls were clean, certainly of graffiti. There was no magazines, there was no newspapers, and pretty soon you've got calendars, nude calendars, in foreman's offices, you've got graffiti that's getting more graphic as they're drawing pictures of women and anatomy. They're leaving magazines open in your truck as you do the shift change. The graffiti is getting more personal and dirtier. Some women, including myself, were confronted with dildos being placed in our work areas just to embarrass us. Then it got a little bit stronger, too. Some women in a different work area, and I learned this much, much later, they literally had to lock themselves in their work areas to keep the men out because evidently men were exposing themselves to them, being very aggressive in pursuing them. So I wasn't the only one experiencing these things, you know. I remembered hearing stories of two women in particular being called by dog names, the Irish Shedder and the Black Lab, calling them dogs, you know, basically to describe them. One of the things I understand, but correct me if I'm wrong, is some of the men or many of the men gave you women a hard time about having porter johns at your disposal. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. That was pretty much at the pit area. We had two different locations for the job site. One was the pit and one was the plant. The pit refused to provide the women who were driving trucks and equipment bathroom facilities. So the women were actually getting physically ill. You know, they told them to go out and drop their drawers. So it took them a while. Eventually they got a port a pot and actually, from there, then they really had an awful incident of a woman who was using the porta potty, and someone with heavy equipment came by and intentionally knocked it over while she was in it. Just terrible, terrible stuff going on. And I'm assuming there were no consequences for the person who knocked it over. No, no. The guys were never punished, as far as I know. There were only four women in that first year. And it's really one of the worst feelings in the world is to feel isolated. I think you can handle almost anything if you feel like you have allies. Was it totally isolated? Did you not share these stories with each other? Um, you know, the ironic thing is I don't remember that we much talked about it other than to say, you know, stay away from that guy or avoid that guy. The thing that I've always found interesting is that the women always, and probably myself as well, we pretty much always understated what was going on. I think in part because this was my first experience with this kind of treatment. So you're not trained how to handle it, for one thing. On a couple occasions, I actually went and told first the foreman, who then made arrangements for me to talk to the manager of the plant. On one instance, he just said, well, they couldn't do anything about it. And I think on another time. He just said I was being too sensitive or something. At one point later, I was even told, did you ever think that he was having a bad day? And I kind of thought, whoa, not to say that it did anything for my day. you know. <laughs> so it got pretty frustrating. By the time the final straw came, I was working as an electrician's helper. And the electrical engineer took it upon himself to send me letters. I believe there were like nine letters that were quite long and quite absurd, for one thing. 
personal for another. It was very clear that he had an issue. He actually sent me gifts that I returned that were of a personal nature. I found out that he was following me. I will call it stalking because combined with the letters and the presence, clearly it wasn't just following. He would later say he was obsessed with me. Anyway, I was on the job one day and he was angry that I'd been returning his gifts and demanded that I follow him into his office. And this was right around lunchtime. And so I hesitated and I thought, no, I don't want to go anywhere with this guy. But then I remembered that his office was right next door to his boss's office. And and it's in the area where there are a lot of clerks. So I thought, well, if nothing else, there'll be a lot of people there. I followed him into his office and he was extremely angry and hurt that I was not keeping his presence. He was behind his desk and I was in front of the desk and he was trying to define what the relationship should be. He grabbed my hands and he came around the desk and he pushed me back into a chair. And at that point, I used my knees and my feet to push him away. I got free of him and I got out of the room and as I'm leaving the room, he hits me on the butt. And the whole time I'm being quite loud, you know, I'm being verbal, I'm yelling at him, I'm yelling for help, and no one is coming. His boss is gone, I walk down all those offices and no one's there except the final office. And I kind of looked over and I, I just, I wanted to say, why didn't you hear me? I was so shaken by what took place. I went to the women's locker room area and I caught my composure I went back into my work area, and I went in to talk to a fellow. The human rights then was combined with union and the company. They worked together for issues that people had on the job. And I went in, and I talked to him, and I asked him to please try to do something with this. And then this was a tipping point, and you shared it with one of the other people who worked in that general area, and you'd think that, okay, you're not going to have to work near him anymore. Right, right. Did any guys sort of see this and step up and give you some support? Were there any men who you felt were trying to do the right thing? The majority of the men were good guys, and the majority of the foremen were good people, too. That was part of the catch-22. You can have one guy that in two seconds can spoil your year <laughs> or your life, and then you'll have 99% of the guys or whatever it happens to be that are just good people. I also, as I was working and learning the various jobs, was able to have conversations with these guys about their families and their wives in a positive way. I literally had one foreman... <laughs> wanted me to come on his crew. He gave me a he gave me a stone, a rock, and said, "This is for you." He says, "We we want you on our crew," and that was kind of bizarre, but it was fun. So you had that contrast with the other percentage of guys who made your life miserable, and also I will say, you know, as the women were not trained and had no knowledge of how to deal with these things, neither did the other men. You know, so I think that everybody was trying to figure it out. I will tell you that one fellow went to Chicago. In Minnesota wasn't legal at the time. He bought mace in those small spray cans that we could attach to our belts. I don't know how many women he bought them for, but he knew what was going on. He was concerned. So we had at least for a time this mace that we had with us. And it was because this guy took the time to go to Chicago to get it. And, and something he didn't need to do, you know. So there's a real good example of someone who did do something. Do you know of anybody who ended up having to use the mace or did use the mace? Not that I know of. I do know at the pit there was a woman who carried a knife. I believe another woman carried a gun. I don't believe they used <laughs> any of that either. But it was sort of reassuring to have something. You know, So he didn't go as far as to report it, and then this gets into your dilemma. I guess if you're a guy in that company and you report it, nothing's going to happen, and then you make enemies among some of the other guys, right? Yeah. Fast forward a bit. Once the charges were made and made official, some guys were fearful of losing their jobs. 
And it wasn't necessarily the guys that were harassing. I mean, the company came right out and said, we're going to close the plant down because the women are going to sue us. And if they're awarded anything, we can't afford it. We'll have to shut down. So think about the pressure of that. Then you had a union. We all took a union oath. And the union oath is you don't turn in your fellow worker. It was your male worker. Well, there was no language in there about sexually assaulting other union members, and there was nothing in there about harassing other union members, especially female. The language didn't include sexual harassment. You know, so if you turned in and named the guy, that made you a bad person in himself. The other part is you certainly couldn't go to the company and complain about a union member as a union member because then you're breaking your oath. So there seemed to be a constant catch-22. So as I understand it, you did go to company officials and report the behavior. Nothing was done about it. Year after year went by. And then finally in 1984, roughly nine years after you started, you filed a complaint with the Minnesota State Department of Human Rights. It must have taken a lot for you to make that move. Yeah, it was a hard hard thing to do. It was a hard decision to make. After this engineer thing, the company now was aware of it. Management was discussing it. I discussed it with the personnel department. Nothing was being done. They were blaming me. This guy admitted what he had done, and they still blame me. Do you say they still blamed you? Yeah, yeah. Well, I asked for it. You know, that's the typical thing, right? Even if a woman is raped, how many times has she been told, well, she asked for it because she was either dressed this way or something. Anything that will excuse the behavior. I remember going into a real funk for a number of, I'm going to say months because I really don't know how long it was. And I found myself not wanting to work. I was actually getting sick quite a lot, too. That was the other thing. I could actually be driving to work, and all of a sudden I would get sick, and I would turn around and go home. Or I'd be on the job, and I would stay away from people as much as I could. You know, it it did affect me. I'm not going to say it didn't. So let me ask you, it was a 10-year legal process since you were certified as a class in this class action lawsuit. And during those 10 years, you continue to go to work at Eveleth Mine. We got our class certification in 1991. Uh, I believe it was in, I'm going to say December, but I'd have to look it up. I didn't last much longer after that because the retaliation on the job was getting worse. There were more incidences happening and the stress. Part of this, I'm also working shift work and working seven day shifts And then you go seven midnights and then seven afternoons. And in between, you're doing this legal stuff. You know, you're in court, so you take a vacation time. So you're not getting a break from anything. So literally, I think my last working day was January 21st of 1992. And I went home and I just sort of melted. And uh, the doctors wouldn't release me to go back to work. The stress had just got to me. I'm sort of amazed that... It took you that many years to melt. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, I, I really wanted to go back to work. I really, really did. Because here we had won, and now I wanted to be there for the women so they could ask questions. And I wanted to also be able to let the men who were supportive of the case, on two occasions, two separate men, during this case in that time frame of the first trial came up to me and said, you're going to have as many men mad at you if you quit or as if you go ahead. So that tells you the dilemma the men were facing. Why would an equal number of men have been mad at you if if you had dropped the case? Oh, because some of the men had wives working in other mines. Some looked at it at a more personal level. If this was them fighting the company on something, Because some of the issues I was having, even though it was sexual harassment was the charge, they knew I was having issues with the company when my son was sick and I had to be home. There were single fathers there who were having the same struggle. They couldn't be home with their children because the company would get mad at them or they could lose their jobs or get into trouble. 
Uh, so they saw it as a broader human rights issue. Let's put it that way. In an odd twist, I'll give you a story that happened early on. There was a lot of rumors going on around the company, and the stress levels were building. And so some of the guys wanted me ousted from the union because I did give names. I named names. I went to the union meeting. I asked for the floor. I was reluctantly given the floor, and I held up the complaint. I told them what it was about. I told them the individual men were not being sued. We were not seeking to have the individual men fired. We wanted a policy. We wanted training. We wanted a fund so that when women hit the wall, there was some way to take care of them. And I said, some of the men who are named in this complaint were witnesses or possible witnesses as well as perpetrators. And I told them we weren't seeking super seniority, which was one of the rumors out there. I told them that we weren't going to shut the plant down. And at that point, I had even told them that we weren't even suing the union. And you couldn't hear a pin drop. They listened. When I finished, they closed the meeting. Some of the men immediately went up to the table and grabbed complaints so they could read them. And one man took the time to come over and say, well, you've got balls. But part of that meeting was one of the men who harassed me in a physical way, totally inappropriate way, who could have gone to jail if what he did was on the street, fought for me to have the floor. He stood up and said, she has every right to be here. Now, that's the twist that I always kind of puzzled in my own mind. And the fact that somebody who harassed you physically gave you the floor, first of all, you do have balls. What? <laughs> no, I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> when you went up there, and it was with which document again? This was the state complaint. The state's complaints, that was what year, roughly? Yeah, it must have been right around 1987. So fairly early in the legal mm -hmm. process. So many rumors were swirling around and so much fear on the men's part. What did you have to do to steel yourself to get up there? Or were you just so impassioned and infuriated that you just charged ahead? Oh, I was definitely nervous. I don't know. I suppose fear, but very nervous. I was not angry, though, and I'm going to say this. I did not make my complaint out of anger. I made no testimony out of anger. I think when people do things out of anger, they either do or say things that may not be accurate or they may regret later. My concern was, this is going to sound odd, I wanted to be fair. This was about trying to get the management and the company to get the policy that they were required by law to have. This was about getting training so that these things would stop and not happen anymore. This was about not just empowering the women by having those things, but empowering the men so they would know what not to do and why they shouldn't do it. That makes for a better workforce. It makes for people who can get along. That means that people can understand that it's all about respect. And that was, in my view, what was needed. I already knew that what we were doing was bigger than me. It was bigger than any individual woman. And it was already bigger than even the women collectively because it was going to have broader ramifications. At every point, no matter what it was, I was still fighting for the same thing. I wanted the policy and the training. And so as an individual going forward, win or lose, it's been set in the minds of the people that this is wrong and maybe we better do something about it on the company part. The company just was not going to let a woman tell them what to do, and they told me that. I always found that so remarkable because I wasn't trying to tell them what to do. I was requesting that they do the right thing. And so ultimately you made that big decision to sue and move forward as the first class action sexual harassment lawsuit. 
which sort of changed the legal landscape in many ways. Let me kind of go back a bit. We sought class certification within the state. An administrative law judge agreed to hear three of us at that point. Two other women were willing to join me almost right away. And the attorney handling the case made a lateral move. And the case was lost. We had to start all over. So that's why I went then seeking a private lawyer. One of the problems with this is what this does to your self-esteem is awful. And so to kind of step up, first of all, and say, and I hate this word, victim, and say, yes, this happened to me. I was a victim of sexual harassment. If you could just keep it to, this was my experience and it was sexual harassment, that's fine. But when you repeat it and you talk about it to someone else and you don't know if it's a safe person, you feel more vulnerable because you don't know what the reaction is going to be. And we all knew that none of us was perfect people as individuals. And so you're always being scrutinized anyway. So you kind of go in there with, am I worthy? So that became an issue for some of the women. Fast forwarding ahead many years, but that incredible Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals ruling on your case, the judge in that case, this is what he said. Would you mind reading that in your voice? This case has a long, tortured, and unfortunate history. It should be obvious that the callous pattern of practice of sexual harassment engaged by Eveleth Mines inevitably destroyed the self-esteem of the working women exposed to it. The emotional harm brought about by the record of human indecency sought to destroy the human psyche as well as the human spirit of each plaintiff. The humiliation and degradation suffered by these women is irreparable. Although money damage cannot make these women whole or even begin to repair the injury done, it can serve to set a precedent that in an environment of the working place, such hostility will not be tolerated. You remember that? Oh, yes. Yes. And I should note, the word victim was not used once. Right. And I was so grateful for that. If you think about the term in itself, it's disempowering to, to have to say, I'm a victim. And it's even more disempowering for someone else to say it to you. You were a victim. So let me then go back, because that was a 10-year process to get to that ruling from the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. Will you tell us what the company's position was during the 10 years of court cases? The company, the position was that we were all damaged when we were hired. And they called it the broken eggshell or something. But yeah, we were all damaged when we were hired, so therefore it didn't matter. Think about that. They couldn't discredit the women and the truths they were telling about their experiences. So then they went to discredit the women in their personal lives. And thus they came up with this cracked shell theory. Think about that. Had they succeeded? No matter what you did in life, and this could be for men as well, if that would have succeeded in any kind of civil case after that, well, we can do what we want because you were damaged when you came. And that would have really sent a message. And that ruling from the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals said, send it to a jury. We get to 1998, and they're getting ready to select a jury, and you and the other women have a big decision to make because you can choose possibly to settle the case or you can put it before a jury. Tell me about that whole decision. So by the time you get to that final thing and you've got this really great ruling from the Eighth Circuit Court, the new judge takes that ruling and says, our personal lives can no longer be dragged out and made part of this. And things are moving in our favor. I'm not going to use the word excited about looking forward to a jury trial, but you get to the point where you do want outsiders who are in a position to say yes or no, this was definitely wrong. You want to finish the process. But right away, the company said, well, no matter what happens, if you get awarded anything, we're going to appeal and drag it out another five years. So then you have that hanging over your head. So you're facing a situation where 
even if you won the jury trial, they would still appeal and you wouldn't see anything. And who knows what would happen on appeal. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I can tell you I had already lost my job, was using my father's car. I was living in an apartment, getting assistance with that. For me, I wanted to go ahead. But I also, my body said no. I had pneumonia by the time we got to that last settlement meeting. There was a number of other women who were diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. They'd reached the end, too, and we wanted to keep going. But things were also, how much more do you have to fight? You know, how much fight is in you? And I will say, the settlement talks were not pleasant. The settlement itself was not pleasant. It gets to the point where you really don't even have a decision to make anymore. I had reached a point, and this is honest-to-gosh truth, I had reached a point where we could have held that trial in the middle of the workplace where this all happened. I don't care. If you would have had every guy that ever worked there sit and listen to what took place, the women would have still won, and they still would have been awarded large damages. That's how ridiculous this whole thing got. That's a very interesting image that you're giving me. So if you actually held the trial in the middle of the workplace and all the men were there, you're saying when these men heard all the details of what you had been through and they'd clearly gotten pieces of it all those years, Mm -hmm. you think they would have ruled in your favor? Oh, absolutely. I think they would have. So the settlement... My sense is the settlement did not make you a wealthy woman by any means, right? Oh, it, it made none of, none of us a wealthy woman. I will tell you that I took my check into my bank with the financial planner there. I was all confidential, and he looked at it, and he went, oh, my God. He says, how are you set up now? What do you need to do? I said, well, I don't have a home. I don't have a job. I don't have a car. He says, this is not a lot of money. Hmm. So there you are. (laughs) And so at this point, you had quit a job that you really wanted to keep doing, Mm -hmm. but the stress was just too much. I mean, I've heard it described in the court documents, I guess, as you were suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. I struggle with using the term, but it was definitely stress and, and it was a syndrome. It's prolonged stress. Lois, after all those years of physical and emotional trauma, are you happy now? I have a really good life. I really, really do. Ironically, it has taken me a long time for my immune system to come back. And there are a couple of years that are kind of going, oh, I don't remember much of those at all. <laughs> you know. But I'm able now to remember recipes that I used to cook up off the top of my head before this whole thing started. And it's been like a year and a half that I've been able to do that. So, but I have a really good life. I have grandchildren who I love and adore. And I have friends who are very supportive and very respectful and old classmates. We get together once a year and just hang out for a weekend. And I have no complaints at all. And it's sort of inspiring for me that as much as this ate away at your immune system, it bounced back eventually in the right conditions. Were there times when you thought it never would? Oh, yeah. Quite literally, I had uh, symptoms of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. So I was in pain, physical pain, constantly. And you're not now? No, not at all. What did you do to get your immune system back? Well, I bought this house. I have a backyard. I would walk barefoot in the grass. I'm a firm believer that that helps. You know, nature helps. Nature is very healing. For the longest time... I couldn't sleep well, so I knew that I had to get my sleep cycle back. At some point, I imagine through all this stress, you used medicine to stay asleep. No, actually I didn't. I was heavily medicated after I was pulled off the job in 1992. And I think it was 97, I decided those drugs were killing me. So I worked off of all of them. And from that time on, I vowed I wouldn't be doing anything like that. Everybody goes through their levels of stressful times. Yours was very extreme. And the story of how you got off your meds after years of being on them. So number one, walking barefoot in the grass and the connection to nature. Anything else you did that other people might say, oh, I'm going to give that a try? Oh, I did physical therapy. 
went to a chiropractor quite a lot, and then I had a masseuse that I went to. I bought a lot of pillows that I thought would help me sleep. The breakthrough was actually when I, I woke up one morning and I realized I'd actually slept. And I woke up without pain. I ran outside, literally. I ran outside. I was just so happy. And I knew it wasn't going to last, but I kind of timed it and it lasted about 15 minutes. But I knew at that point everything was going to be okay. When was that out of curiosity? Oh, that was probably in 2002. Wow. So, yeah, it took a long time to get that part. And then the rest is, you know, like a physical injury, if you re-injure it, it does more damage, right? Right. So I had to really be careful of stressful situations. And I had to learn to say no and walk away from a lot of things, a lot of things that actually broke my heart to not be part of. That and setting boundaries became real huge. So I've learned to walk away from and cut off people that are toxic, that don't belong in my life. And that's been very helpful. It's also hurtful and it's very hard sometimes. And I try to do it without putting blame or making accusations, but it's all about this is my space, this is my health. You don't belong in my life at this moment. You read the news, you follow the stories. Of all the sexual harassment stories that have just sort of come our way in these past couple of months, is there one where you say, oh boy, given what I, Lois Jensen, know, I wish I could just advise this person to do this, or I wish I could let the nation know this? Oh, wow. (laughs) That's huge. Well, let me try with this. It's never about you. It's about the person doing it and whatever they're expressing, whatever they're physically doing to demean you or humiliate you or put you down or put you in place. It's never about you. It's about them. It's what's going on with them, in them, and who they are. And it has nothing to do with who you are as a person on the receiving end. I think it's wonderful the women are feeling empowered to come forward. I think it's important for them to be heard, not just listened to, but heard. For some, there will probably be legal cases that they'll pursue. It's important that these women know what their rights are with their employers or the harassers, but it's also important they know their rights within the legal system. And I'm very much now interested in client rights. The ironic thing is stepping forward requires bringing yourself to a point of power, even if you're just stepping into it. And then you get into the legal process, and it seems to me that the whole process is like disempowering you because you have to go through it time and time and time again. And it's an assault on, first of all, your story, then it's an assault on you. And I will tell you this, in the process, there were times when I thought, had I committed a crime, I would have had more rights. And that, in a civil case like this, it's like the attitude is, well, you volunteered for this. And so there's some leeway given to the opposing side. I'm hoping that changes are made so that women don't go through what we went through. But my understanding is that they do. Let me ask you, if someone had told you when you filed that first complaint with the Minnesota Department of Human Rights that this would not come to a conclusion for 14 years, would you have done something different? Oh, gosh. If you're handed a card, do you play it or do you not? I knew I was going to lose my job either way. I think I would have anyway, because things were getting so awful at work. Women were literally, their lives were being threatened for a couple of women. One woman had reached a point where she was willing to jump off a seven-story building trying to get away from a man who was threatening to rape her. So my answer is yes, I would have. The seven-story building, was that a structure at the mine? Yes, it was the crusher, the main crusher. But... For anyone, even if it was a single-story building, for you to think that your option is to jump versus to have this guy come at you, how awful. 
which gets at a point that, as you described what your goals were in this whole lawsuit, there wasn't a trace of revenge as a motivation. No, no. That's just who you are? Yeah, I think so. But I will tell you that there was a small time frame, and it was ironically more after the case, that some things really, really made me angry. And I expressed that anger, and I sort of regretted expressing the anger, but at the same time, I learned huge things from it. And so, you you know, you just work through it, and you forgive yourself, and you learn from it, and you move on. I'm always curious when I hear stories of people who have gone through enormous hardship, as you have, how their sense of humor survives. How did your sense of humor survive your experience as a minor and as a plaintiff? You know, I had to work at it, I think. You have to step away from it. I literally went and bought a bottle of bubbles, and I went out in a swing set with another gal who was going through such a terrible time within the case. I said, come on, we're going to go play. And we went and sat on the swings, and we blew bubbles. And after a while, she started to smile. We felt silly, but it felt great. You got to find that child, I guess, is maybe a way to do that. Find that child that's somewhere in that adult who's going through such a stressful time. And then laugh at yourself. I mean, there were times, my gosh, and I still do find myself doing something really stupid, and I'll go, oh, and then I'll just laugh because, you know, you let it go. Lois Jensen, thank you for joining me on Wave Maker Conversations. Well, thank you, Mike. It was nice talking with you. My conversation from 2018 with the remarkable Lois Jensen, a historic figure in the battle against sexual harassment, the lead plaintiff in the field's first class action lawsuit, Jensen versus the Eveleth Taconite Mining Company of Minnesota. If you found this conversation with Lois Jensen informative and even inspiring, I hope you'll subscribe to Wavemaker Conversations wherever you like to get your podcasts. And if you don't always have time for a full podcast, but would like to stay up to speed on the best of Wavemaker conversations, please consider signing up for my newsletter, which you can find on Substack or on the homepage of my website, wavemaker.me. I'm Michael Shoulder. Thank you for listening to Wavemaker Conversations, where curiosity meets hope.